for him to then talk to his own conservative white politicians about the need to release Nelson Mandela. So that, for me, is the value of scenario planning. Encourages us to think about the unthinkable. To be alert to the signs of change that are there, it's just that we're not seeing it. Well, let me, in your hand out there, you'll see there are four scenarios that I've laid out. And I'm going to walk through them now uh, for the remainder of my presentation this evening. Scenario number one is what I've called business as usual. The suggestion is simply that cycles are a natural part of economic life. In other words, that what the global financial crisis that we're going through is similar to other financial crises. This is part of the economic system. It's a bit like getting drunk on a Saturday night, throwing up on a Sunday and being ready for work on a Monday. Look at Alan Bond as the sort of the vomit of the Australian economy. So that we just go through these cycles. There's nothing really to worry about. We've had the Roaring Twenties, which gave rise to the Depression of the 1930s. We've had the Roaring Noughties. Now we've got the, great, the global financial crisis. Don't worry, it'll all pick up. And humans don't learn from history. So somebody comes up with a great scheme, everybody buys into that scheme, uh, like the South Sea Bubble proposal from 250 years ago, or buying tulips in the old Dutch Empire 200 odd years ago. People will, will just go in, buy something during a boom period. The smart ones are the ones who get out early, and they're fine. But it's the people who arrive late, who buy at very high prices, they're the ones who end up getting their fingers burnt. But humans don't learn from history. Therefore, if you are following this scenario, which I think basically is a scenario of both the current government and the current opposition uh, in Australia, if you accept the, this view, of, of this paradigm, this world view, therefore we need to bear in mind that you shouldn't panic. Economies do recover from crashes. We had the crash of 1987 in Wall Street. In 1987, in one day, Wall Street lost the equivalent of the French gross domestic product in one day, in 1987. If you panicked, you would have sold your shares and you would have lost a lot of money. If you didn't panic, if you just sat back, then the shares would have done very well. They would have recovered uh, in price. Similarly, we had the 1997 Asian crash. Those economies are gradually picking up. It's just the way that these things go. Um, and therefore, don't panic. We need to focus instead far more on the good news and not talk down the economy. And the people who survive are the financially cautious who avoid excessive debt. So I know a lot of people who have just sailed through the global financial crisis completely unaffected by it. They are people who have not overextended themselves, they have not got themselves deep into debt and they continue to make money. In fact, we, the billionaires around the world, in most cases, have done better in the last year than in previous years. So don't panic. That's the second scenario. The implications for Australia is don't worry too much. Australia has faced and survived far worse crises. Obviously, the invasion of Japan at the beginning of World War II is an example. And instead, look at Australia's strengths. We've got an educated population, we're highly regarded internationally, and we've got plenty of resources. I think that's the official world view of both political parties. Now, they will argue over the, the, the finer points, but essentially, that's their world view. And that both parties expect the economy somehow to recover. Let me go on and give a second scenario, what I call breakup. And what we're looking at here is the rise and fall of the United States. And this is um, a viewpoint uh, put forward originally by Professor Paul Kennedy um, of the University of East Anglia, now at Yale University in the United States, who wrote an academic textbook called The Rise and Fall of Great Powers. Um, it's an interesting book. It was designed for undergraduates because that's the area that Kennedy taught. Um, it's 500 pages. I recommend that you just read the first and last chapters and skip the intervening 450 pages. You'll learn more about the Habsburgs than you'll need to know in a universe. Basically, his argument is that if you look back at what we might call the European history of the world, so every few centuries you end up with a new dominant region. So, obviously, a thousand years ago it was the Arab world. Perhaps 700 years ago it was China. You know, the Chinese, 700 years ago, built the world's largest all-wooden structure. 
it remains to this day the largest all wooden structures. The, obviously, it's the forbidden city in Beijing. But the Arab world went down, the Chinese world went down, and we have had for 500 years a European era. And I've also thrown into that era the United States as being a product of that European enlightenment and renaissance and European values. And uh, Paul Kennedy has argued that if you look at each of the superpowers, so we start off with 1492, remember it's in 1492 that Columbus sailed the ocean blue, so then reached the United States. The Portuguese uh, went via the east, ended up in East Timor, Macau, etc. So we start off with Portugal and Spain. Then later on you get the Netherlands, then you get France, and you get Great Britain. In each case, a country starts out as a small trading country. It develops overseas trade links. It then develops a strong military to protect those trade links. It bankrupts itself in foreign wars. I've added, I've added the footnote to his cycle that you then end up as a tourist attraction. Why else would you bother to visit Spain or Portugal or the Netherlands today? Or Great Britain, for that matter. So, Kennedy wrote his book in the first edition, came out in the late 1980s. And at the end of his book, just simply left this phrase hanging in the air, is the United States destined to go through that same cycle? In other words, that the Americans had started out um, before 1941 as an isolationist country. George Washington, the first president, had said to his fellow Americans in his retirement address, don't get involved in Europe's wars. They're all mad in Europe. Keep out of Europe. Just build up the Americas. Focus on America. And so the Americans, through well, with a very brief period, 1917, 1918, but all the way through, basically, until Pearl Harbor, on December 7, 1941, the Americans were not a major military player. Indeed, in 1940, the army of Greece was larger than that of the army of the United States. And so President Washington had said, don't get involved in foreign wars. George Bush, Governor George Bush, in the year 2000, reaffirmed that. His policy was ABC, anything but Clinton. He was not going to get involved in nation building as Clinton had done in the Balkans dispute. Now, by contrast, the United States is bogged down in Iraq, although it's gradually pulling out of Iraq, and Afghanistan. And Afghanistan is the graveyard of empires. We know from the 500-year survey of Professor Kennedy that a nation is not rich because it has a large military force, but it can afford to have a large military force because it has a strong economy. And so the question is now, is the United States in terminal decline? In other words, has the Americans gone the same, have the Americans gone the same way as the Spanish, the Portuguese, the Dutch and the British? They've overextended themselves. They've got bogged down in too many conflicts in too many countries. And are they now too heavily indebted to China? China is now the largest singer of lender of money to the United States. It's almost a relationship between a heroin addict and the dealer that the dealer is lending money to the addict to buy more heroin back from the dealer. And that's how the United States and China are locked in this particular relationship. Debt destroys empires. So as we saw with the British Empire in World War II, bravely fighting the Germans, but getting deeper and deeper into debt. And so at the end of, of World War II, it was quite clear that America would be the new global superpower because the old one had now bankrupted itself. And so it is debt that destroys empires, and empires tend to die via suicide rather than murder. So instead of an empire being wiped out by foreign invasion, it actually begins to weaken itself from the inside and ultimately then commits suicide. And so whoever's going to replace the empire, such as the Americans replacing the British, simply steps into a vacuum which has already been created by the empire itself creating its own suicidal conditions. It gets vain, it gets arrogant, it loses its energy, it squanders its opportunities, it gets heavily into debt and destroys itself. 